The next item of business. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Uh, presiding officer, I seek your guidance on a matter that I believe cuts to the heart of this Parliament's standing. I hope it is not controversial to say that the truth is essential to the way that government interacts with the people and with this Parliament. SNP ministers and MSPs have been repeating the claim made by the First Minister on the 29th of September that 98.8 per cent of our energy was from renewable sources. Now, the First Minister corrected her incorrect claim quietly in the official record, but it remained inaccurate. I sought clarification from the Chairman of the UK Statistics Authority, who has written to me, and he states that the First Minister's clarification is incorrect. The First Minister will no doubt seek to clarify that her clarification was wrong. The figures are, for the record, 63.1 per cent. Now, whether the First Minister misled Parliament on purpose or otherwise is a matter for her conscience, but she has a responsibility, as we all do, to be accurate. When Ministers say things to the Parliament that are untrue, Correcting the official record behind the scenes and on the quiet is not enough. Furthermore, the official record should not be treated by ministers like a 1984 Ministry of Truth, giving ministers a get-out-of-jail card for mistaken or misleading statements. Once the misleading statement is made, it is in the public domain, through Parliament TV and through its archives, and the way that we all use the videos of these sessions. I very much doubt that many people check that everything that was said in this chamber reflects the official record. It has been said in the past that if you tell a lie big enough and repeat it often enough, people will believe it. The truth is important, despite the heckling from the SNP benches. The truth is important. Presiding officer, what powers do you have? to compel ministers, especially the First Minister, to come to this chamber and clarify in person, verbally, when they have made a mistake? What powers does this Parliament have to allow oral statements to this chamber to correct mistakes and misleading information? We must find a way to avoid the perception that lies are being told for political ends. Thank you. I, would, um, I thank Mr Kerr for his point of order and I would um, remind all members that we have a duty to treat one another with courtesy and respect at all times. Um, and I would certainly prefer if we didn't have suggestions that members were um, treating one another in, in the way Mr Kerr describes. Mr uh, Kerr will be aware, as will all members, that members have a personal responsibility for ensuring that their contributions in proceedings are accurate. In the event that a member becomes aware that they have provided inaccurate information, then they can seek to make use of the existing correction mechanism. Uh, Mr Kerr was asking what, par what powers the Parliament and the presiding officer might have, but this Parliament has previously agreed a mechanism. Um, uh, the Parliament has previously agreed what steps are appropriate, appropriate to make other members aware when a correction has been made. Corrections, too, are highlighted in the Business Bulletin and on the Parliament's website to ensure transparency around the use of the mechanism. The procedure, too, does allow for a member to seek to make a statement to the Parliament if they realise that a significant error has been made. The decision on whether or not to seek to make such a statement is a matter for the member concerned. We will now move to topical questions, and at question number one, I call Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports of misuse of fireworks and pyrotechnics on Bonfire Night. Minister Elena Whittam. The disorder and thuggery that occurred on and around Bonfire Night, involving not just fireworks and pyrotechnics, but also bricks and even petrol bombs, was sickening. And I give my heartfelt thanks to our emergency services for their dedication and their bravery in working in appalling situations to keep our communities as safe as possible. And I welcome the fact that Police Scotland have made clear that investigations are ongoing and that they aim to bring culprits to justice. And I urge any member of the public with relevant information to get in touch with the police, either directly or anonymously through Crime Stoppers. Katie Clark. 
Thank you, and I warmly welcome the Minister to her new role and associate myself with the comments that she's made regarding the emergency services. Between 2016 and 2020, there were only four solemn and 16 uh, summary firework convictions and no firework convictions whatsoever in 2020 to 2021. Given the way the Scottish Government have constructed their proposed licensing scheme, it makes it even more important there are convictions. How will the Minister ensure that there are convictions arising from this year's events? Minister. I thank Katie Clark for her question and her, her welcome. Um, there is no equivocation on the part of the Scottish Government. Where there is offending of the type that has been seen over recent days, we will fully support Police Scotland in pursuing investigations and where sufficient evidence ob is obtained, using their powers appropriately to make arrests and bring charges. As regards to convictions, it is difficult to get an entirely comprehensive picture because of the range of common law and statutory offences which may be relevant. As regards, um, this is also a matter for the courts. It would be wrong for ministers to criticise or second-guess the sentences which the courts impose, as only they have all the weighted evidence in front of them. I am clear, however, that the sentencing powers of the courts in this area, under a range of common law as well as statutory provisions, are extensive, and I will be keeping a close eye on how things develop. Katie Clark. The Criminal Justice Committee considered the recent fireworks legislation there was considerable discussion about how people might bypass the licensing system by being, buying online or on the black market. Will the Minister take steps to find out where the fireworks which were misused came from, whether they were bought in a shop, online or obtained elsewhere? And once there has been a full investigation into the full circumstances of this year's events, will she ensure there is a full report to Parliament? Minister. Whilst at this point in time we are not aware of any clear evidence to, to suggest that there is a lot of black market sales um, and that it is a widespread issue, we do know that there is an isolated incidents involving the supply of illicit fireworks products. Enforcement agencies have well established processes in place to tackle black market sales. Um, and there, you know, there's a, a big multi-agency um, planning that's carried out every year that involves Police Scotland trading standards and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to identify and tackle emerging issues. We will, and I plan to work closely with enforcement bodies to monitor illicit firework sales in Scotland. And as part of this, the Scottish Government has funded trading standards to undertake a fireworks enforcement engagement project with retailers building on the success of similar projects um, last year. And this is something that I will keep a close eye on and bring back to Parliament. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. It is important that we acknowledge the appalling behaviour by some over the bonfire weekend, including the incident in the Sight Hill Park area of my constituency. However, we should also note that the number of calls police received related to such behaviour was down from 581 last year to 483 this year, a 17 per cent reduction. With this in mind, can I ask the Scottish Government what work was carried out by the Scottish Government and partners in preparation for the bonfire night period? Minister. Whilst I do welcome the year-on-year -year reduction in incident numbers and the 17 per cent reduction is very welcome, um, it is absolutely imperative that we make sure that bonfire night um, does not happen the way that it did because it was intolerable. We support the vast amount of multi-agency partnership work that is undertaken by our emergency services local authorities and wider community safety partners in preparation for bonfire fire night period. And on bonfire night itself, I attended the Operation Moonbeam Gold Command Room in Belston Glen to witness the effectiveness of the partnership working and see the scale of the challenge faced as it unfolded in real time. And I cannot praise them enough. Planning and preparation for bonfire night includes prevention and diversionary work in local communities by a range of partners, particularly in the areas affected most by fireworks, where we do have um, serious and multiple deprivation. With partners, the Scottish Government also launched our three long-standing national public awareness raising campaigns um, to make sure that we do enhance the messaging on the new proxy supply offence. And again, we have funded trading standards colleagues so that they are better able to promote and enforce the new legislation around sales. Sue Webber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A constituent of mine wrote to me yesterday to express their concern about the disgraceful scenes across Edinburgh at the weekend after violence erupted and police were injured in petrol bomb attacks. 
A substantial number of youth terrorised residents by throwing fireworks at innocent car drivers, incendiary devices at emergency response vehicles, police vehicles were attacked and officers suffered facial and eye injuries. This behaviour was utterly disgraceful and cannot be repeated. The SNP rushed through the fireworks bill in June, but have done nothing to address community safety concerns. Will the, will the Minister commit to reversing the SNP budget cuts to the police to ensure our officers have the resources to tackle this type of disorder and keep our communities safe? Minister. Whilst I will associate myself with Sue Weber's comments with regards to the intolerable behaviour that we did see, at this point in time we only have a resource spending review in front of us and we actually don't have um, a budget set. But I will definitely keep a close eye on this because our communities can't endure what was um, seen last weekend. And we need to make sure that we have enough resources in place to do that early intervention and prevention work um, that we do need to do in, you know, in our communities where there is multiple deprivation and we do see a rise in, in these types of cases. So um, I will come back to the member um, on, on this issue. Thank you. Question number two, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to mitigate the threat of avian influenza outbreaks amongst domestic poultry populations in light of its impact on wild bird populations in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Mary Goujon. The Scottish Government has already taken steps to mitigate the threat of avian influenza in the wider domestic populations through the introduction of National Avian Influenza Prevention Zone on the 17th of October. This made it a legal requirement for all bird keepers to follow strict biosecurity measures to help protect their flocks, and this was in response to a risk assessment and follows the worst outbreak of the disease on record. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Birds do not stop at borders between Scotland and England, and so as long as that is the case, nor will avian flu. The same threat that exists south of the border that the UK Government have acted decisively to mitigate exists here in Scotland. Amidst the largest outbreak of avian influenza the UK has ever seen, over 200 cases and many culls, according to an FOI from the ferret, since October 2021. Why is the Cabinet Secretary just monitoring when England is acting decisively? Cabinet Secretary. I don't think that that's a fair assessment of the situation at all, and I hope the member would appreciate that we take decisions and we base our decisions on the best available scientific advice and expertise that we have within the Scottish Government and through our Chief Veterinary Officer. Now, I know the member is referring to the mandatory housing order which was implemented in England this week, but any decision to require mandatory housing has to be based on risk to improve animal health and welfare concerns. And that kind of decision has to be based on the balance between the positive and negative impacts that housing otherwise free-range birds might have. And this is not a simple or a light undertaking. Uh, as the member is aware and as the chamber will be aware, the situation is being kept under constant review and the decision on whether a housing order is introduced is a matter for Scotland's Chief Veterinary Officer and it follows that analysis of a wide range of available evidence. Rachel Hamilton. Presiding Officer, the NFUS have labelled the Scottish Government's response as wholly inadequate and as we speak, more outbreaks are being confirmed across the country in Aberdeenshire, in Orkney and reported sightings of wild birds in distress in my own constituency of the Scottish borders. Evidence shows that housing flocks reduce the, the risk of birds being infected. Birds are no respecters of borders. So the Scottish Government must explain the basis for its decision, given the importance to businesses approaching the hugely significant Christmas market and the ongoing devastating loss of wild birds on the coast and in our countryside. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, firstly, I just want to emphasise that I completely appreciate the member's concern here, and I, I've heard those calls from the NFUS and, and had those discussions as well, and I completely understand just how concerning this must be for, for poultry keepers in Scotland, uh, given the sheer number of challenges that the, the industry as a whole faces at the moment, together with this. Now, uh, as I've said in my previous response, this isn't a simple light or light undertaking. 
and it needs to be based it's based on scientific analysis and the evidence that we have at the moment so the member talked about the number of outbreaks that we're seeing across the UK there are a, a number of outbreaks in England I believe the last number was 107 that we've seen there we've seen six in Scotland the CVOs in Wales and Northern Ireland also have not taken the decision uh, have not to introduce uh, a mandatory housing order now the types of uh, consideration that or the issues that we have to give to consideration to when that decision is taken is looking at the numbers, the geographical distribution of poultry cases, the epidemiological reports on risk pathways, risk assessments on disease risk level, alongside case numbers and the geographical distribution of wild bird findings uh, as well. Um, these are just some of the considerations that the CVO and her team have to look at when making these decisions. And I hope the member can appreciate again that we I depend on that advice from the Chief Veterinary Officer and uh, depend on that expertise and the, the scientific analysis that's undertaken when we're looking to make these decisions. Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is clearly a worrying time for poultry farmers. Um, my understanding, though, is that keeping birds indoors is not a, a silver bullet for combating avian influenza. Uh, the recent comments of the Chief Veterinary Officer give us assurance that Scotland's approach to the situation is being led by the evidence. Can the Cabinet Sec Secretary set out some detail on how other methods to prevent direct and indirect, indirect contact between flocks and wild birds could help to protect poultry from this disease? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, the Scottish Government has published some uh, guidance which has been developed jointly with DEFRA and Welsh Government uh, on our gov.scot web pages um, with guidance on biosecurity and preventing welfare impacts in poultry and captive birds and advice for all captive bird and poultry keepers and that includes game birds, waterfowl and pet birds and it also has published an avian influenza prevention zone self-assessment checklist. But I think it's also important to emphasise some of the, the key requirements that we'd be asking or looking for keepers to follow. And some of that includes checking the integrity of buildings where birds are kept for any defects that could potentially allow water ingress or other contamination, fencing off uh, or netting any ponds, standing water, a waterlogged land in the range to prevent access by poultry or other captive birds and also using uh, a government-approved disinfectant at the correct concentrations. But again, all of that advice, which has been developed jointly, is available on our web pages, and I would encourage keepers to look at that. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The impact on the poultry sector of the worst ever avian flu outbreak has been devastating, with more than 90,000 hens alone culled. With new cases still emerging, that number will rise, as will deaths amongst wild birds. So if the Cabinet Secretary has ruled out introducing a, a housing order at this time, we do need to see robust implementation and monitoring of biosecurity standards. But there have also been worrying reports in England that avian flu has been found in game birds, such as pheasants, reared in captivity and then released into the wild for hunting. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what assessment has the Scottish Government made of the likely number of pheasants that have died of avian flu and whether their release has had any impact on spreading this deadly disease? Cabinet Secretary. I, I'd be happy to get back to the member with further information on that, but I would just come back to the initial point that he made about the difference that excellent biosecurity measures make in this type of, of situation as well. Again, we haven't ruled out a mandatory housing op, uh, order. I, we are continuing to monitor this situation every day, and the, that could well change, and we could well look to implement that. But again, we need to base that on the analysis and the evidence that we have. 